Welcome to In Focus with Eden Lay. Competitive cheerleading has joined the Broadway musical. Bring It On is at the Buell Theater and we'll visit a cast member who's from Colorado and began as a cheerleader. But we begin with a visit to Colorado Symphony at a rehearsal for Symphony No. 3. We also learn about the exciting new community-focused programs for Colorado Symphony from Interim President and CEO Jim Copenhaver. Well, thank you for stepping out to, to talk to us today as we were here for the first rehearsal of Symphony No. 3. But uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today was to find out about the exciting new programs, new outlets that Colorado Symphony Orchestra has in store for the musicians and the community. Well, um, as you know, uh, we have a long tradition and history of performing in Betcher mm -hmm. and doing work here. Um, the, the, you know, Colorado's uh, only full-time professional orchestra. Um, but the community has expanded and grown, um, and that presents a challenge for us because people living in the outer boundaries of the region sometimes feel like it's a long haul all the way mm -hmm. into Betcher. Um, and we feel a responsibility to bring our music to them as opposed to expect them to come to us. Um, the other factor is that some of the music we play, um, some particularly chamber kind of music and Baroque music, actually doesn't play well in Betcher because it's too large a venue yeah, so for that much. kind of music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you put five or six people on this stage, it just doesn't work real well. Um, so it's an opportunity for our musicians who like to play that, like to play in small ensemble groups, um, now to have an opportunity to do that professionally on the stage uh, with audiences. In addition to that, we have the capability to do standard chamber orchestra music with our players. At times we're doing that on here, we'll, have, we'll do a Mozart piece that requires 35, 40 players. Um, we can now take that on the road and we can take it to a Lone Tree, we can take it to a Newman Center, we can take it to Arvada, and we want to have the opportunity to do that because we think we want, will deal and, and provide that service to the community in a much better way. It also provides new outlets for you mus the musicians in the orchestra. It, it absolutely does. It helps keep them together through this challenging period. Yep, absolutely does. And we believe in the long term, uh, if we come to people and, and perform in their neighborhoods, they'll see the value of this as a community asset and they'll be willing to make contributions because only half of our income comes from earned ticket income. The other half has to come from contributions. And that's pretty normal for Typical an for an orchestra, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yeah, orchestras in the performing arts orchestras are farther on that balance point, 50-50 kind of thing, and compared to theater companies, for example, which mm -hmm. tend to run 60-30, 60-40, I mean, or 65-35. So in addition to <coughs> the regular events we're, we're coming to expect here at Betcher and the special events in the summertime at Red Rocks, yep. now you have so many more that you can offer. What was we also, I, I would add to that, it's not only what's in the classical uh, genre. Uh, we have a very talented set of musicians. We have n a number of people who play jazz very well. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Hill, who's doing yes. uh, you know, a symphony work uh, this weekend, plays in a jazz group and performs and does recording with that jazz group. Um, one of our percussionists plays on a uh, steel drum band. Uh, they have a wide variety of that and of course we do uh, you know the popular music too, big band music and, and that kind of thing. And, and music from the cinema. And yeah, mm -hmm. so we're going to bring you know the John Williams kinds of things out as well because that typically is done with a smaller orchestra and it tends to be more the brass and winds and less of the strings and that kind of thing. So it allows, again, our players uh, to have a wider range of performing opportunities as well as, again, it works to, to take the music to where the people are and not expect them to come to us. With, with this new direction of focusing on the community in, in other pockets of our area, what else can we do as people who love music and who love the Colorado Symphony Orchestra to make sure that it's a healthy organization and, and we never risk losing it? Well, the, the most important thing is come and be a part of it. Um, come to concerts, see it for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, we think that will encourage you then to become a partner with us, which would, in addition to buying for the ticket and perhaps mm -hmm. sending us a contribution, 
Um, and also see the other work that we do, because in addition to performing uh, more regionally around the metropolitan area, we're going to expand our educational programs too. We do a lot of work with DPS. We do some in, in Jeffco. Um, but again, the geography uh, and the cost of busing kids here or doing that, we want to go to them more and do educational programs on a wider scope. It's easier in the to future. take, uh, uh, you know, a couple dozen musicians right. than to bring busloads of Bus kids. Busloads of kids in here, and and it's you know in today's education world, time is a factor for them. They're so busy trying to get all the material uh, in front of the students. Uh, so if it's an hour to drive to Din to Betcher and maybe 30 minutes to go to some location out in Douglas County or out in western Jeffco. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll help them with that process, but give the kids a chance to, to see and hear the, the symphony. Are there other ways members of the community <clears throat> who love the work that you do here can, can participate? Well, um, we typically have a, a volunteer cadre. We're going to uh, strengthen and reinforce that, so if people would like to be a part of the Colorado Symphony, um, we have the need for all kinds of unpaid staff <laughs> and uh, for, for doing things and, and working whether it's in the educational side of it or in the summer in particular when we're doing parks concerts mm -hmm. you know we need many more people in, in that regard uh, to do the chores and tasks that need to be done to put on a parks concert. After such a, a, a challenging period for the orchestra it's really exciting to hear these these wonderful ideas being implemented, and I'm so glad you took some time to share it with us today. Well, it, it's um, from our perspective and from mine personally, as, as you know, this is, um, I've been back, this is my fourth time back working with the <laughs> symphony. And it's because I love the people on that stage. They're good friends of mine. But the more important reason, this is a community asset. It's a very important community asset. It's one of the things that makes Denver, Denver. And so we need to protect it and, and sustain it and, and make it better. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It was a delight to listen in as Colorado Symphony had their first sight reading rehearsal for Symphony No. 3, written by their own principal timpanist, Bill Hill. When rehearsal concluded, I had a chance to sit down with Bill to learn about his work with Colorado Symphony and his life as a musician in Colorado. Today was the first sort of sit-down uh, rehearsal for your new Symphony Number no. 3. The Col first ever sight reading of it. How did it go? Um, it went great. Um, there are a lot of little details we have to work out, but... Um, That's always the case. Of course. <laughs> I mean, we also... the first half of the rehearsal rehearsed a piece that's 67 years old and we had to work out a lot of details on that also. <laughs> now you're also a member of the Colorado Symphony. Yes, I'm the principal timpanist. How long have you been with Colorado Symphony? Oh, now you're going to get my gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> this is my 32nd year. 32nd season, Symphony. wow. Yes. So you've seen it change and grow and, and struggle and survive through a lot. Absolutely. I, well, when I came, it was called the Denver Symphony Orchestra, um, but I've never really wanted to go anywhere else. I've uh, played with other orchestras a bit. Mm -hmm. um, as a guest artist? Yeah, and, and uh, as a guest timpanist, etc. Um, but I love Colorado. I'm a ski bum at heart. <laughs> Is that the only reason you want to be a musician here in Colorado, so that you have good access to good skiing? <laughs> no, um, I love the whole local scene. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a great place for our two children to grow up. Um, I love that we have such a great combination of arts and wonderful nature. That's, those are my two things, <laughs> you know, the things that I love the most. And I love the mountains uh, and I love downtown. I love going to the art museum and mm -hmm. seeing what the latest contemporary exhibit is. As an artist who chooses to live and work here in Colorado, what is, what is that like for you as an artist to be in this environment as opposed to being in a symphony in a larger metropolitan area? Um, <laughs> it fits me way better than anywhere else. Um, I've lived in large cities, uh, but I don't thrive there. I, I don't, I grew up, you can tell my accent, <laughs> I grew up in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia at a small college. And I love being able to, from my home, I can drive 15 or 20 minutes and be hiking in the foothills. 
Um, and I love being able to drive 20 minutes and be downtown also. I love the combination. And but how do you describe the Colorado Symphony Orchestra? How do you describe the work that you do here? Um, I love the work that I do here. We play a very similar schedule of concerts uh, to any of the top orchestras in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and the orchestra is fantastic. I mean, the, the <laughs> unfortunate thing uh, for young players is that there are many, many more fantastic players in this country than there are jobs. And the musicianship that they can draw from here reflects that. Absolutely. I mean, everyone that sits on this stage has won an audition where they probably had to beat out 150 application, or 150 applicants, mm -hmm. and those uh, are not uh, applicants, you know, from some small school. Those are Juilliard and Indiana and Eastman and Curtis. Probably for some of the very same reasons you choose to oh, have been sure. in this orchestra for 32 years. <laughs> Everyone loves it here, and uh, we get fantastic conductors like Larry Ratcliffe that's here this week. He's just, he's just terrific. He conducts all over the world, and uh, it's, it's great. It's also great to have a home base. You mm -hmm. know, um, when I went to college, I wasn't sure if I'd be a jazz musician or a classical musician. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that being a classical musician, I actually have a home that's <laughs> kind of where I live and we play <laughs> most of our concerts here. I, I actually play about 170 to 180 concerts a year. And I would say 150 of those at least are right here in Betcher. And your, your work as a composer yeah. is also uh, featured elsewhere. Yes, yes, I do get to go to other orchestras here and there if, if you know, if we're having an off week or mm -hmm. if uh, maybe it's a pops week where they don't need me uh, so much here, then uh, I get released occasionally and can go uh, to other orchestras and have my, have my concerts there. And sometimes I go as a soloist and sometimes as a composer, sometimes both. This isn't the first time that Colorado Symphony Orchestra is mounting one of your <laughs> new works, is it? No, um, I don't actually know completely the number of pieces, different pieces of mine, but I did uh, look it up because some I get asked this question. Mm -hmm. And over the last 32 years, the symphony has done more than 50 performances of compositions of mine. That's an amazing That's, achievement for any composer, much less one who is also working as an artist themselves. Oh, I, don't <laughs> <laughs> I never think of it as being amazing. I, I love my work and uh, I mean, you can ask my wife and kids, they sometimes forget what I look like, <laughs> but I, I love the work, so it, it doesn't feel like an achievement. It, I feel really, really lucky that this is what I get to do and actually make a living doing it. One of the unique things about Symphony Number no. 3 is that they're not just playing a piece of yours. This was commissioned by Colorado Symphony Orchestra from you. That's right. Um, they uh, actually commissioned me to write two works uh, over the last uh, four, to, and including next year. Um, about five years ago, a, a new work of mine, a percussion concerto, was done uh, with my friend Peter Ungen conducting, and it was uh, fortunately very, very successful, and uh, so they decided to have me write some more pieces, so that was great. What is that like when your coworkers, your colleagues, are also the musicians upon which you set your piece? Um, it's, it's absolutely wonderful because I know the capabilities. Um, and if it were the case, I would also know the deficiencies, but there just simply aren't any in this orchestra. So I can, I can write pretty much whatever I want to write. And the, the fact that I have spent 32 years and, and before that a number of years in other orchestras, um, I really know the sound of the instruments and what mm -hmm. my colleagues can do on each instrument. And it's, it's really fun to write, you know, thinking uh, I'm writing a particular flute part for Brooke or I'm writing a piccolo part for Julie or for Peter Cooper, the oboe part, you know. Uh, it's really fun to know uh, with confidence that I can write really quite difficult music and that they'll just play it amazingly. It's very different than just writing a piece not knowing what orchestra will play it. Right, right. Most orchestral pieces, I would guess, around the country, I've written a piece or two that I didn't, you know, have a commission from a specific orchestra, 
But I would say most new pieces are commissioned pieces. I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds of hours of work. It's probably uh, equivalent to writing a 800-page novel. I, I mean, it's the amount of details that go into a 30-minute symphony are kind of mind-boggling even looking back on it. No wonder you say your family sometimes forgets what you look like from the front. <laughs> they well, always see the back of you while you're working. <laughs> right. Uh, well, actually, my, all my writing I do at home in the basement. So I have, I have a studio there with about 200 percussion instruments and my goodness. piano and a writing desk. So so this symphony number no. three, um, uh, it's sort of in line with some of your previous work that I got a chance to preview. But um, the influences are kind of interesting. You, you've drawn from some uh, established classical c compositions and some rock and roll, a little Led Zeppelin in there. Yes, uh, there's just a little, uh, <laughs> there's a little chord. Isn't that fun to describe it that way? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, I love it. Uh, I mean, the, the Led Zeppelin thing is a chord progression that many rock groups use. Um, it, uh, technically what it is, is just the fifth of the chord moves up a half step mm -hmm. uh, and then another half step and then comes back down. It's also a theme that's in all the James Bond movies. <laughs> Anybody would recognize it. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I love uh, being influenced by many, many different things. There are nature sounds in this piece, little mm -hmm. bird calls. Uh, and then there are uh, sort of mechanistic uh, Stravinsky-like really driving hard dissonant rhythms. Um, there are influences from Arnold Schoenberg, the twelve-tone music. There are some little signatures that one can pick out if you're if you're really paying attention. Absolutely, there are several little quotations from Bartok. Uh, my friend Larry, the conductor, said, "Oh yes, and I also <laughs> got that little bit from the piano part for the two piano and percussion sonata." And I'm going, yes, you're right. <laughs> so it does two things by doing it that way. It makes it a little more accessible for someone who doesn't come to the symphony very often. I think so. But it also is it's that sort of inside recognition from people who do get to come. Yeah, it's almost like a little inside joke <laughs> with the orchestra. Oh, there's even uh, a quote from the Berlioz Roman Carnival Overture that's, again, very hidden, but when the player plays it, I, I noticed one of the players <laughs> today on stage almost laughing. It's like, <laughs> no, you got to have a horn in your face. You can't laugh. <laughs> so uh, coming to the symphony isn't as stuffy as someone might think. Do I look like a stuffy? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I've never thought of it as being stuffy at all. I, um, I love, well, you can hear in the symphony there, and uh, I write and play jazz, I write and play ethnic music. And you like um, movies, I can tell. It's very cinematic <laughs> sounding. Yeah, I'm actually not a big movie person. Just but, the, but maybe the music. But the movie. music, oh mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. We just did a show, you know, last week, all the Bugs Bunny cartoon mm -hmm. music, and it was fantastic. It was just <laughs> such great uh, stuff. And that's all based on classical music. Right. But uh, I, I love being influenced by a lot of different things. I've never, um, well, where I grew up, the Shenandoah Valley, uh, that was a nice S, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, bluegrass is king, you know. Right. I, I grew up 20 miles from the Carter family homestead, and they still have bluegrass and country music every Saturday night on the farm there. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, I've, I've never thought that in any type of music there's room for snobbery or this is this is high class and that's not i i think all music is is wonderful and uh i've my son uh, actually got me he's a very fine drummer uh, he got me into metal <laughs> a few years ago and uh so i've i've actually written pieces with influences from the metal bands and uh i it's not my favorite thing to listen to but I can certainly recognize the technique of the mm -hmm. guitarists and the drummers. I mean, they have phenomenal chops. <laughs> so I think we can all learn from anywhere, you know. Does it, does it feel like a, a chance to maybe be a little bit more um, risk-taking when you're doing a concert <laughs> at that time of year? Um, I, maybe so for the symphony. Mm -hmm. um, I think a musician that doesn't take risks is, is not a living musician. I love um, that. I, I think every single composition, I, I have more than a hundred compositions out there. Um, everything from symphonies to chamber music to jazz to rock. 
uh, to ethnic music. And I try in some way every single piece to experiment, to push my own boundaries. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm trying to write music that will insult the audience or the listeners. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, I mean, that's what all the great composers did. And I certainly don't compare myself to those composers. But if you look at the progression of Beethoven's music from his first symphony to the ninth, or uh, I mean, he constantly was pushing his own boundaries. Mm -hmm. Same with Mozart. Um, uh, to not push those boundaries, to me, I, would, I think I would stop writing. I know you have a few recordings out of some of your other work. How do we find out more information about those? Well, uh, I have several recordings on the Albany Records label. Mm -hmm. um, but the best way, actually, to get a hold of my recordings is to email me. And I'm not a good business person. I don't <laughs> have a website yet, but I will within a couple of months. What's the name of your latest CD? Um, my latest CD actually is on Albany Records, and it's a very cool project. It's the University of Denver Orchestra with Lawrence Golan conducting. And we played the Seventh Symphony of Beethoven, or the students played it. Mm -hmm. And my second symphony is the companion piece. 7.1. Yes, <laughs> you're right. It is, it's called Beethoven 7.1. Uh, it's a modern version, an abstracted version of all the themes from the Seventh Symphony of Beethoven. It was Lawrence's idea, and I just love the idea. So you can hear the traditional Seventh Symphony of Beethoven, and then you can hear a, well, a couple of my friends described it, uh, Lawrence being one of them. I won't tell you which descriptions it is, though. <laughs> One said, uh, this is Beethoven on steroids, and someone <laughs> said, this is Beethoven on some really bad drugs. <laughs> Either way, it sounds like fun to listen to. What's the name of that CD? Um, it's just called Beethoven 7 and Beethoven 7.1. Well, I had a chance to, to listen to that, which is why I remembered the title, and I enjoyed right. that. And I really loved hearing this first rehearsal of Symphony oh. Number no. 3. I can't wait to come and hear it. Thank you so much. It, uh, First rehearsals are always a little, uh, I wouldn't say rough. The orchestra actually played the piece very, very they well. Did. But uh, there are a lot of little details of balance between the sections that we'll work out. And uh, you heard there are some electronic sounds mm -hmm. floating around the hall, and we'll, we'll get all of those tweaked a little bit. Uh, that's why we have rehearsals. Well, thank you for sitting down with me right after your first rehearsal. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eden. It's nice to meet you and to be here with you. To learn more about all the programs at Colorado Symphony, visit their website at coloradosymphony.org. The high energy world of competitive cheerleading meets the Broadway musical. From the Tony Award winning creators of Avenue Q, In the Heights, and Next to Normal, Bring It On the Musical is now at the Buell Theater. One of the cast members has a cheerleading background from right here in Colorado. Here's my conversation with David Rank. Did you ever think you'd be in a production going to Broadway? I honestly, no. I did, I did not going into it. I was starting off with cheerleading. It was purely just for fun and something extra do, to do on the, on the side, on, along with my other sports. What other sports did you play? Um, in high school, I was a swimmer up through high school and ran track and then did, picked up cheerleading my junior year. What brought you to cheerleading? Um, honestly, it just looked fun. It was something I had watched some videos online of all the co-ed performances and the squads that went out. The ESPN and competitions and exactly, all that. <laughs> exactly. Um, so basically from there, uh, my, a friend of mine, his mom was the coach and she was trying to start a co-ed squad. And, and you um, did some of that right here in Colorado. I did. Um, when, I, when I first moved here I, and went to Colorado State, I started cheering for CSU when I was here, and then after I believe the first, after the first full year or second year, I um, audi uh, tried out for the Nuggets, and then did that for a few few years after that. What so. was that like? The Nuggets was great. Uh, we had so much fun with it. Uh, I got to meet a lot of really cool, really interesting people through it. A lot of my friends that are that are coming to the show this weekend are my friends through n cheering for the Nuggets. And we also got to do some international stuff, which was really fun as well. How did you get cast and bring it on? How did that happen for you? I, well, I work for uh, a company called UCA, which is Universal Cheerleading Association, and 
the production team of Bring It On got a hold of UCA, and they call, they had us bring some uh, cheerleaders from our staff down to Memphis and work a couple days just to to kind of see what you need a cheerleader for and mm -hmm. what you can substitute a. What could the actors do, and what would you really need to cast cheerleaders? Exactly. In? So um, from there, I, I was down working with uh, the director and choreographer for about two or three days. And we just having a great time, and from there, he asked if any of us were going to audition. And had you thought of it? I had heard about it. I honestly, I and I had considered it, but it was not wasn't something at the time before the audition before all the auditions in the city started. It wasn't something that I had set. On doing, but well, I'm awfully glad you stepped up. I am as well to do it because we had such a great time seeing the performance last night. I defy anyone to come and see your show and not have a good time. It is a really fun show. It definitely is an exciting. Well, you knocked him dead last night, and I know you will tonight. Thanks for coming in on your way to your call. For tonight. Thank you for having me. This is very nice to meet you. On its way to Broadway, Bring It On the Musical is playing at the Buell Theater. Visit denvercenter.org for ticket information. That's all for this edition. Remember to join us on Facebook and Twitter. With all that Colorado has to offer, we're here to help you keep it in focus. Thanks for watching. Good night.